thanks so much for making the trek to Clearwater Bay. And a warm welcome to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for uh, an HKCPD Harvard Symposium, the second one. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lillian Wong, who is the project leader of the hub, uh, to say a few words to kick the day off. Uh, and so, Lillian, over to you. Thank you. So, I'll just touch on what I'm prepared to say. So, I'm going, not going to look at what I've prepared to hear. So, thank you. Welcome. Uh, good to see you all here. In fact, we have colleagues from all eight UGC funded universities here and rep uh, representatives as uh, presenters and also participants. So um, I believe that more are coming. We have um, 180 uh, registered participants for today's event. Okay, so uh, as Nigel said, uh, this is the HOP uh, annual event. And uh, for, I think, a number of you have been also um, joining us at different activities that we organized throughout uh, the year. For example, some uh, collo uh, colloquia, um, seminars, workshops, sharing sessions, so that we have, uh, we have organized it um, at different universities. And so on this, Project, we have five uh, UGC funded uh, uh, language centers so um, working on it. So we have Hong Kong U, uh, UST, uh, Poly U, City U, and EDU. So we have the representative here. I just want to <laughs> you to recognize them because they have been working really hard uh, with me and together. Basically, um, we communicate every week and uh, most of the days, uh, like 10 emails or more. And we meet every month for a few hours, at least three hours. So it's a really collaborative project. Uh, so we have Nigel, who you just... Uh, yeah, Nigel, yeah, and uh, Christy from City We also have Stephen Bolton, who Uber. is Uber. Yes, Uber. Uber. He is on his way. Okay, so uh, we are the um, uh, the main members of this hub, and we also have um, community members. Um, I believe that some of you are here, um, working with your representatives at your own university. So you may want to put up your hands. Yes, yes, they're the community members. Oh, that's Stephen. Yes, thank you very much. So they also have been helping to organize activities. But uh, today we have our communities uh, annual meetings too. You will hear more about what these communities are doing and uh, the activities that uh, they will be organizing for next year. And we really would like you uh, to participate, not as a participant. In fact, we would like you to join us to maybe host to lead some of these activities because it is really a uh, community for, um, for teachers learning and professional development. So we hope that we can work together to share our expertise and to learn from each other and to collaborate and to move forward. So uh, that's our main goal. So today uh, we have 26 presentations from different uh, colleagues from different universities. And uh, so um, we hope that you will have an enjoyable and uh, inspiring day. And yeah, Christy is just reminding me that. In fact, um, we also have been organizing activities for next year. For example, uh, international conference next June. We already got, so these are the dates. We already got uh, the five in, so that's uh, you know, uh, kind of mid-June. Um, we are going to send out call for proposals right after this conference, uh, sorry, this symposium. These are the five keynote speakers. And um, so uh, it will be a three days, a two and a half days conference to three days. And then we also have key conference uh, workshops. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, it is an international conference. So so it is bringing, um, you know, show, showcase our um, work and uh, also uh, bring international uh, people to Hong Kong um, to, to see what we have been doing here. And 
we also have been organizing uh, some activities for next year. For example, we will have uh, Penny Er and Steve Walsh uh, doing some uh, seminars, workshops, a series of uh, um, you know, activities with us, uh, staying with us for a week in Hong Kong. And actually next week, we also have an instructional designer visiting different universities to help us with uh, uh, the development of e-learning and, uh, and also branded learning fit classroom ideas. So uh, visit our website and join us as uh, one of the members, as I said, not only to participate uh, in the event, but also to uh, organize and lead with us. All right, so um, yeah, there's a lot of information there, so I'm going to stop here and uh, hand over back to Nigel uh, to, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, thanks, uh, a very rapid start to our day to make up on the little bit of time that we lost. It gives me very, very great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Claire Ferno from the University of Reading in the UK. Uh, who's going to talk to us for our first plenary this morning about critical thinking in the classroom. How can EAP help? Good morning and welcome. I think it's amazing to have a group of universities working together with teachers across the sector within a context to come together for workshops, for plenaries, for sessions like this. And I think your international conference next year will be really, really exciting. And um, I'm rather hoping I'll be able to come, but I'll have to see if my university will let me out for good behaviour. They don't always. So today um, I'm going to talk about... Uh, critical thinking in the curriculum, how can EAP help? I'm going to answer a few questions. I have a huge number of slides, and Janice here uh, has got permission to shoot me if I go over time. So, um, what is critical thinking? Why does it matter? I'm going to talk a little bit about the, well, a lot about the disciplinary variations in critical thinking. We're going to talk about the challenges for students. And when I talk about students, I'm not talking about international students, I'm not talking about Chinese medium students or Chinese students, I'm just talking about students, mainly about undergraduates. But certainly within my university, our students struggle with critical thinking, the home students, the international students, the academic staff struggle with critical thinking. It's a bugger, really, critical thinking. It's a pity we have to do it in many ways. It's a real challenge. So I'm not, um, I wouldn't presume to talk about your students, but I would like you to be thinking about your students, and I'd like you to be thinking about your colleagues. And then we'll move on to talk about how can EAP help. So there's the cartoon as to, uh, well, I won't say any more about that, as to why we're doing it. Let's begin, as all good sessions must, with definitions of critical thinking. Um, the View from Study Skills, I'm sure many of you know this book by Stella Cottrell on developing uh, critical thinking skills. She talks about it as a cognitive activity, she talks about mental processes. I am going to go quite fast. Anthony, again, if you feel that it's too, it's too fast, you can put your hand up. So Anthony is, your, um, is the lightning rod here. 
There's a view from Applied Linguistics, Carson and Leckie, their excellent book on reading in the composition classroom uh, from 1993, where they talked about um, critical thinking and the, the ability that it gives to transform information uh, and the synthesizing knowledge, prior knowledge, current knowledge, and bringing together reading and writing. Academic literacy. Academic literacies, whether you make it singular or plural. And here is a quote from Mark Mason at a conference here in Hong Kong, and I believe he, he's, he is, or certainly in 2007, he was an educational philosopher at Hong Kong U, talking about critical thinking being this combination of disposition, probing questions, we'll come back to questions later, I have a lovely cartoon about questions, um, and about bringing together knowledge, different types of knowledge, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit further, because I think it's really helpful to us to think about what's involved here. So he says that critical thinking, actually, he pulled together a whole range of different philosophers' views on what critical thinking was, but he said, actually, in his opinion, and I agree with him, it pulls together all these components. So the first aspect is critical reasoning, okay, just being able to do it. And this is what I, this is, this is part of my technical term, a bugger, it's, it's, this is part of the challenge. This issue of disposition, you have to want to do it. You have to have the right disposition to do it. And that doesn't come naturally. Some people are, are naturally very critical, but many people aren't. So that having that, developing that disposition, being skeptical, being able to ask those difficult questions is part of it. The third thing he talks about, which I think is an interesting aspect, is moral orientation. What is it about critical thinking that, that, that comes from a moral perspective? right and wrong, if you will, okay, uh, amongst other things. And then he talks about content, but you can't be critical if you don't know the content. And he talks about two kinds of content, which I think is particularly interesting. Uh, and the first one is that one there, the concept of critical thinking. Knowing about critical thinking, what it is, what constitutes it. And then the second is having a discipline in which to be critical. I can't be critical in applied physics. I don't have the background. I would sound ridiculous, but I can be critical in applied linguistics. I can be critical in education. I can be critical of my own culture, my own content, context, my own political system. I'm from Britain. I have a lot to be critical about at the moment. Um, but you know, I wouldn't presume to be critical of the Hong Kong context or the Chinese context. Okay, so so I think that's quite an interesting uh, thing for us to remember. Students have disciplines, but they also have to know what critical thinking. Okay, and that, of course, is what many of our students would prefer. Okay, that's the other way of thinking about it. So why does it matter? Okay, if you're an undergraduate, critical thinking very often is the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room, from an undergraduate point of view, critical thinking, is what is it? Some students see it as being uh, avoiding plagiarism. Other students see it as giving your own ideas. Other students see it as being critical of the reading that you've done. Actually, it's, the, it's all of that. But there is a danger that some students get hold of the tail, some students get hold of the ears, some students get hold of the trunk. So we've got to help them to see the elephant in the room and to see that critical thinking is core and that it is a whole. And that's what we're going to be talking about now. In more detail from the chalk face and this is my earlier this term I was marking an undergraduate dissertation draft chapter and the student had been working on so this is a final year applied linguistics student who'd been working on um, in applied linguistics English language home student and I had to give her feedback on her chapter which was her findings and discussion chapter and I'm just going to show you my feedback I'm going to look at it through three different lenses so first of all and this is the generic thing. Like I had also, I've done the sandwich thing. I said lots of nice things first as well. Okay, but so I was talking to her about uh, about the need to pull together her different sets of data. She'd got some wonderful data. She'd gone into a school for the deaf. I was looking at how literacy skills were being developed amongst deaf children. It was absolutely fantastic. Part of her challenge was actually just getting access. Getting, and she almost sort of collapsed in a heap when she got in and met some of the children and met some of the teachers and she thought, you know, that was the job done but we had to work a little bit more on that. So she had wonderful interviews with kids and teachers, she had some classroom observations and she had evidence for other materials, like the teaching materials for literacy. 
but she hadn't linked them to the research questions. And then, as I said, she had this amazing data and she wasn't doing enough with it. She had literature that she'd looked at. She'd looked at phonics, for example, and how phonics is used for hearing children, but she hadn't made very many links to that when she was talking about her own study, and she struggled with that. How are deaf children taught to read in English? And she also had this propensity, which I just loved, to talk about large amounts of literature. Like, you know, we go into the supermarket and we say, I have a kilo of, of literature, please. So it's sort of the volume of it. It was some kind of a, a sort of a accountable noun, uh, large amounts of that they're on. And I had to point out to her that we can't do that. Other students like to talk about vast amounts. I think they think that that can carry a lot of weight, and it doesn't. And also this issue of the intratextual linking within the dissertation itself, so that you've got to refer back to the early bits and the bits that are coming next. And also, there are all these things she missed out limitations, reflection, and suggestions for further research. So from her point of view, these are all the different things she's dealing with within her text. She's got findings to talk about, she's got data, more data. She's got to talk about the literature, she has to draw on that. She's got to make do this intertextual linking, she's got to join it up in different parts of her dissertation, and she's got to talk about limitations and methodology and further research. And where does the critical thinking come in? Where is the elephant in the room in all of this? Well, of course, it is the linking. And it's deciding what's relevant. Is it relevant to talk about phonics when you're talking about deaf children? Well, it is actually, but what aspect of phonics is, is, is important? So that making those decisions, using her data, making links across her text, back to the literature, but also within the text itself, earlier chapters, earlier sections, and then this issue of discussion, reflection, and suggestions. And this is the culmination of three years of academic study. This is a student who by now should be able to do this, and she can't, or at least she certainly can't at the first draft stage. She's just, she doesn't know it yet, but she's just got a two one for her dissertation. She's got um, uh, she's done, she did well, because this kind of feedback, and the more detailed feedback, and feedback on other chapters, um, I hope pointed her in those directions, making her think of these things that she had to, the elephant, bringing her back to the elephant. And then, that's my discipline. I'm an applied linguist, that's my discipline. So the question is, of course, does that apply to other disciplines? So I asked colleagues from 18 <laughs> different disciplines this question. They were all doing their exam marking, so it was a little bit of light relief. I asked them two questions, this is the third question, and um, they all came back to me. I have wonderful colleagues. And this was the question, what does critical thinking mean to you in your discipline? And there was a second question, which comes later. And here is a task for you. I'm going to put some quotes up from my colleagues, and I'm going to ask you what broad cluster does each of the following quotes that you're going to see come from? Are they from, is it from a science discipline? Is it from a life sciences discipline? Arts and humanities or social sciences? Okay, so just those, those four. So let's have a look at them. I'm not gonna ask you to put your hand up, I just want you to think, okay, which broad cluster of disciplines does this come from? There's the first one. Okay, so just read that and think about which broad cluster Discipline from a disciplinary point of view, does this come from? I know some names in the room, but I'm not going to embarrass you, Anthony, by saying um, <laughs> Matthew or Adam. Um, so, and that was the that was the task. Remember, what broad cluster does each of the following quotes come from? Okay, quote again. Okay, you happy? Has everybody got there? Albert. Philosophy. Did you get it? Humanities. Arts and humanities. Did you get it? A little pat on the back. Okay, here's, here's another go. What about this one? Okay, again. Which which is it? Okay, I'm calling that life sciences. I must go back and ask my colleague, are you a life scientist or a heart scientist? But anyway, it's one of those interdisciplinary disciplines. Okay, good, you get that right? Get that right? Next one. Okay, and 
there's the clusters. <coughs> Economics, social sciences. You get that one? What a good group. Okay, this one. And then I looked at this next one. <coughs> okay. Which which cluster is this in? Hard sciences, life sciences, arts and humanities, social sciences. Yeah. I looked at that one, and the answer was politics. But then I thought, hang on a minute. <coughs> Yeah? It applies to all disciplines. It doesn't just apply to politics. You could show that to your economist, to your chemist, to your mathematician. So that got me thinking about, and I took, I took all their definitions of, of what they thought critical thinking was in their discipline, and I produced uh, uh, this wordle. And actually, looking at the words here, you'd be very hard pushed to say, okay, ability, oh, well, that's hard sciences. Or research, oh, no, 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 that's its only... Um, life sciences or information well, that applies to us humanities what was glorious about this was that actually there was a lot more in common in terms of what critical thinking is across the disciplines than there was variation when i asked colleagues to define what critical thinking meant to them okay here's my second question and i asked my colleagues to focus on undergraduate students i've got a couple of quotes about master students, but actually mainly about undergraduate students. Thinking about, okay, what does this pose? And again, I'd like you to look at some quotes that I'm going to present you with, but I want you to think how similar are the views that are being expressed here to your views as English language university teachers, your opinion of your students and the way they grapple with critical thinking. If, if you are doing it with them, and I think probably most of you are, even, even with the first year students, that you need to be doing that. And certainly we're hoping that more students, I know that there's been a change in the education system in Hong Kong, and uh, that people are coming out of schools, I hope, I hear, your curriculum sounds interesting at secondary level, with this sort of liberal, um, help me with the terminology, I don't know what the module is, <coughs> liberal <laughs> studies, yes. I hear it's under threat, is that right? But I like the idea of it. Anyway, please don't let it be threatened, because I quite like my students to be doing it too. It sounds like a really good thing. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to comment on other people's contexts, and I just did. Okay, how similar are these answers to your, your colleagues' views? Okay, here we go. And there's going to be a lot coming up here, okay? So I'm starting with, with my wonderful archaeology colleague, who said, this is, remember, what are the challenges of critical thinking for your undergraduate students? And he said <clears> that it's a real challenge for students with this kind of an educational background. Remember, he's talking about home students. We don't get a lot of international students in archaeology at undergraduate level at my university. Home students, British students, okay, in this context. The ones that have come out of this kind of an education system. And we've gone back more to that. We've gone back much more to an exam-based system. RA levels now are all based on exams. I've got friends, kids doing GCSEs, which is our exam of 16 at the moment. All exams again. You know, welcome to the modern world. Um, and uh, one of my favourite quotes about education, which I find deeply depressing, I'm going to share it with you because I don't see why you shouldn't be depressed too, <laughs> which is um, children enter school as a question mark and leave as a full stop. <laughs> and that's certainly what's happening in Britain at the moment, I would say. So, kids that have come out of secondary education, which has got them doing this, when you take coursework away, and you put it all back onto two or three hours out, that's what you get. And you get this. You get this. I have colleagues who say, I cannot give my students, uh, I can't ask them to do any formative work because they only want stuff that counts for their module grade at the end. Would that be similar here? Do we give our students? Yeah. You know, of course, students are like us. They're instrumental. Um, if, if the message you're being given is all that matters is your mark, then all you're going to focus on is your mark. Okay? That's, that's called evolution. 
those are clever kids. Why should we do that? So, so that's a problem for my wonderful archaeology colleague. Here's another one, back to economics. Same sort of thing. Same sort of thing. Ta give, give me the knowledge, transmission. I'm here, I'm an empty vessel, fill me. Right? Philosophy, back to philosophy. I like this one, okay? That this is what they have to do. Remember, this is the challenge, this is the thing they find in. This is what they have to do. And I really like that as an, as an applied linguist. So here we have philosophers saying, doing philosophy is learning a new language. You could argue doing chemistry is learning a new language. Doing mathematics is learning a new language at university level. So that's something I think we need to talk to our students about. What is the new language in your discipline? Social anthropology, and this is one of my colleagues who mentioned international students particularly. This is a challenge. Students know they have to do it. They know we're looking for it. Now, how do they show it? How do they show that they've got the elephant in their tank, that they've got the whole elephant in there? How do they show that? That's a real challenge for our students. If it came naturally, that would be an issue. But this is a, this is a skill we have to acquire. <coughs> It's not something that comes naturally to all students. Most students can't argue. And she talked about overseas master's students because she was talking about the products of undergraduate education and that part of the issue for them is the volume of reading, but also being able to extract the arguments from reading. And she made the point that it can be working in a second language. I mean, being critical in your own language is hard enough. Doing it in a foreign language, what are we thinking asking our students to do this? Doing it with IELTS 5 and 5.5 and 6 and 6 point, I don't think any, you know, this is really hard. Back to students' educational background. She's talking about international students here. Students' educational background. What are they bringing with them? What's the educational background they come from? What's the undergraduate culture? in their home societies. Okay, and she works with students from 30, 40 different countries. So educational background is as important as language ability. Or at least it's up there. It's all part of what helps you to define the elephant, to present the elephant in a way that is acceptable. Here's law. For me, there was a surprise here. I thought in law there was a right answer. I'm really worried now. Okay, there isn't. Of course, there isn't. I was just if you go to see a lawyer, you want a right answer, don't you? Yeah. Um, students struggle with this kind of students who choose law. They don't like this. They're worried about having to do this to build upon their knowledge. Okay, and they really don't like this. It's where having to present and to weigh up. Have those conflicting <coughs> positions being equally valid. Equal. So part of the elephant is being able to see that you might have two elephants. You might have an elephant and a dinosaur. And uh, I've got to be careful where I go with this metaphor. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but, but the, the, they are equally valid. They can be equally valid. You, you, your job as a student of the subject is to talk about that and to make those sorts of decisions. It's really hard. It's really hard. Typography. Typography. Oh, typography. That's fonts and writing and publishing. And, you know, that's nice and practical. Okay. And what Jerry told me is that in typography, there are two premises that have been questioned that students, their students, their undergraduate students, really struggle with. Again, because of their prior educational experience, what they're bringing with them from their secondary schools. This view that knowledge is linear. You learn one thing, then another thing, then another thing. So you build up an elephant from the front. You start with the trunk, and then you add the ears, then you add the, the tusk. This metaphor is not going to keep working. But the idea that knowledge is linear, and that that's all you have to do, is build it up piece by piece. And then this point about definitive answers, and I'll come back to definitive answers, that there is an answer. There is an answer. 
and that that is something they have to unlearn. And where do you find the answer? It's in the mark scheme or it's in a past paper. That will give you the answer. Accounting, another subject. I thought, ah, oh, okay, there are definitive answers there. And she talked about, because this is a subject that has a lot of international students, has a lot of Chinese students, incidentally, um, but my university, excuse me, anyway. So English language ability is really important in accounting. And not all students won't necessarily have the English language ability when they arrive, but they've got to be prepared to do this. They've got to have the commitment to go into deeper level of learning. And that can be a challenge for the students that don't want to do that. So if you want to get a good degree, you've got to engage, you've got to commit to this. There are shortcuts. We all know what they are, but ultimately they don't work. They don't work. Um, but, you know, to get, to get a good degree, to move on afterwards, to get the kind of job you want, you have to engage with the elephant. You can't get someone else to write the elephant for you. You can't smuggle an elephant into the exam room and just present it as your own. You can't, um, yeah. Okay, psychology. Here we go. Here are some of the challenges. Back to law. Back to some of the other disciplines. No right answer, per se. Economics. Archaeology. They were making these points too. And this point about integrating it. So not only do they have to be able to show that they can do it, but they've got to integrate it. It's not an add-on. It's not something you do at the end. It's not the icing on the cake. It's not the icing on the elephant. It's part of the elephant. It's part of the cake itself. Okay. <coughs> and from a psychology point of view, it's a practical um, science as well as a theoretical science, that it's actually really important. Good psychologists are critical thinkers. They can reflect on their own practice. Nobody wants to go to a psychologist who just opens a textbook and sort of analyzes what the issues are. You have to be critical. It's an integral part. Reflecting on what you do is an integral part of your own practice. If you can't do that, you won't succeed as a psychologist. Back to food and nutritional sciences. Talking about confidence and students being lacking in confidence in what they think themselves about the literature, what they think themselves about experts. And actually, when you join a new discipline, it's really hard to know what the discipline it expects. And I think it's really important for all of us. A while ago, I did a module in, in typography myself. I wanted to look at critical uh, web design. I didn't know what the norms were <coughs> in typography. I didn't know you had to put screenshots in your assignments. We don't have screenshots in our assignments in English language and planning. And I didn't find out. They didn't tell me. It was a while ago. And they said, probably thought she's an academic. I got a lousy mark. I said, what am I supposed to do? What is so this? Challenging the literature, challenging the experts, but knowing what the genre norms are as well. And she made the point, remember this is food and nutritional science. These are people with backgrounds in chemistry. Um, and they're doing a lot of chemical stuff. Um, it's a wonderful department, they make ice cream. I don't think I need to say it. We're often invited to go and taste it, well, amongst other things. So, but academics, academic writing skills are a different challenge very often. Computer science. Okay, this is a real challenge for computer science students, particularly because there are now so many sources online. So they've got to be able to choose the right ones. And they don't necessarily expect to do that. They expect to be able to just perhaps Google the key term, and then the sources are all there, and you just sort of work your way through them. This, this selecting key sources, and then they've got to be able to apply critical thinking in their practical work. So just like my student with her study of deaf students, learning, deaf kids learning to read, computer scientists have got to be able to make decisions about the information that feeds into the design of their work and how they test and implement the computer programs, for example, that they are working on and the strategies that they use. So critical thinking is core in computer science as well. Chemistry. I love this one. 
okay? They don't want to do it with their science students. Really, 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 they don't want to have to evaluate arguments. Um, they just want this. Not all of them, but they want that certainty. They want certainty. But I don't think this is unique to science students. I know economic students with the same view, and you're asking humanities, some of my applied linguistics, you know, what's the answer, Claire? You know, language and gender, what's the answer? It's 22, is it 42? Okay. <laughs> Meteorology. This is not a commercial break for the University of Reading, may I say. It's just that we have a lot of fantastic world leading subjects which are in Okay, back to how they were taught at school. How they were taught at school. One accepted and well documented argument the right answer. They want the right answer. How is the plan? How is climate change going to be solved? Is there a right answer? You know, we don't. We can't. We can't let these students get away with this. It's too important. You know, they have to learn. There isn't. There isn't one right answer. And this is really a challenge for these students. These are bright students. We only take the top, the top ones for meteorology. We're, we're top in the country, top in Europe, top in various things. I can say that because I'm not in that department. Um, but you know, these top, top, top students from around the world struggle with this. What is climate? How does it function on our planet? And they've got to change their perception of how knowledge is generated and disseminated. Even those top students. That's Isn't it a lot? Yeah, math students get very annoyed if you practice, 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 <coughs> practice, and then you give them something different to do. Okay? They don't want that. They like the certainty again. Okay? And they get really annoyed if you give them something in the exam that's more difficult than most other class. And actually, I get that. They don't see it as a challenge, they see it as an irritation. And we're back to wanting the right answer, as our law students want, some of the other disciplines that we see. They don't want subjectivity. A bit more on that, because I really like this. Okay. You know, I didn't study maths, I have to be critical. You know, I didn't study maths, I have to think. Um, and that's an interesting thing. And it's one of the things that um, the university that I'm associated with, well, it's my university, um, and we have a link with the university in China. And one of the subjects that we're doing for two plus two degrees is maths. I said, you're mad. Great maths. China, they're way ahead of us. Way ahead of us. What are you doing? They said, uh-huh. I said, sorry. And they said, well, yes, they are way ahead of us on pure maths. But what we can give them is applied. Applied. So when they come to our university to do the years three and four of a four-year degree, we don't do the pure maths. They know that backwards. We work with them on the applied maths. And that's what they get from that. That's the value added. That's helping them to compose the whole, evident, uh, whole elephant that is maths. But I love this. And this is British students. This person wasn't talking about Chinese students. This person was talking about British students. So yes, please don't make us think critically of maths. And then, of course, mathematicians also have to cope with statistics. Woo. Again, there isn't just one answer. All of us use statistics in our work. You're going to hear some this afternoon from back here, I think. Uh, and you know, there isn't just one answer because statistics, as we know, what is statistics, statistics, down lies and statistics. You can do anything. My husband's an economist. Hopefully you won't be watching this. Um, you can do anything with statistics. We know that pretty well. You can make statistics say almost, well, I don't do almost what you want. And so in statistics, our math mathematics students struggle because there isn't just one answer. They've got to choose which statistic test to use, and sometimes they lack the confidence to do that, to go out on a limb on their own and to say, this is the statistical test that I think is appropriate for this data to achieve this end. So, again, I did a Wordle, a, a word cloud, thinking about all those words that my colleagues had said pose critical thinking for their undergraduate students. And again, you wouldn't necessarily be able to go into this and say, right, that applies to chemistry. 
that applies to archaeology, that applies to food and, food and nutritional science. But the words are there. Knowledge, reading, language, understand, key terms, etc., etc. And my, you, I said to my colleagues, just give me one sentence. One sentence definition, one sentence challenges for your students. Some of them did that. The economists did that. The scientists tended to do that. So the stereotypes are coming out here. But politics. Well, here we go. And my fantastic uh, head of politics department gave me this answer. I'm going to go through it with you in some detail. I don't apologize for that because I think this is what universities are all about. So let's go through together. Okay? He talked about students having this, this transactional uh, attitude to gaining expert in PIR, politics and international relations. He talked about that. Okay? And it's partly a result of the massification of universities. <coughs> when only 5 or 10% of the population went to university, they could, uh, they, they, they could be, if you will, less transactional. They, they could be there studying the subject for the love of it. But if you're going to send 40, 50 or more percent of your students to university, dream on. You know, they're not there. You know, for the joy of learning, they're there to get a degree that will get them the job that they need to be doing. And I think we have to be really, really upfront about that. But along the way, let's help them to get to grips with the elephant. Okay, so more from Mark. Again, British students coming in from high school, right? Not answers. We have that already, and that expectation that it will be the same in higher education. And this is his wording: they've got to accept this. And I would argue the joys in the argument in meteorology, it's in archaeology, it's in typography, it's in all those subjects that we looked at earlier. Okay, they have to learn this. That's what university education is about. Chemistry, computer science, who knew? Okay, so I don't think we can just say it's only arts and humanities students that have got to do this. I love this, sifting the granular layers. Okay, to evaluate the strengths of competing arguments. This is where you want them to be by the end of the third year. This is where I wanted my dissertation student to be when she's thinking about deaf students learning to read in English. I wanted her to have evidence-led arguments of her own about the best way to do it. And the evidence is based upon the reading that she's done. It's my job as a supervisor to make sure she does the right kinds of reading to help her with that. But it's also evidence from her own observations and her own data that she collected in that context. Having the confidence to sometimes fail, to sometimes fail, to get it wrong, because that's how you often learn, taking risks. And our, edu my education, our education system doesn't encourage students to take a lot of risks, I don't think. Okay, <coughs> back to this reading, engaging with the literature, the commitment that we saw, accounting, remember? talking about having to engage in the think and to go in depth. Okay, so you can't just read the one textbook or the one article or the one website. You've got to be able to select the right ones to read and then you've got to read them. I love that bit in red. This is a man who enjoys his food. <laughs> But there's the morsels of brilliance. The morsels of brilliance. Okay. This is something from Nazi's subject. Brilliant teacher. Giving the discourse time to breathe. So not just that <coughs> essay printing it out, submitting it through, turning it in, but letting it breathe, sleeping on it, thinking about it, giving the whole, the discourse time to breathe. Or, and our students don't want to do that, partly because we give them too much to do. We've got too many other bits of work to do. But if we don't, we, if we don't allow them or encourage them to have time to, to let the discourse breathe, then we get this all boxed up, off and tied up with a bow. Look at that. Then when you study politics, so it can apply to Hong, but there are other disciplines it could apply to. And certainly, meteorology, that's what's going on. 
<coughs> these metaphors being able to see under the skin of the literature, trying to have that big picture view. We have an elephant in this context. And what can I as a student deliver in terms of the new insight? And certainly, as I said, politics in Britain at the moment, there's a lot of new insights. If anybody's got a good insight on Brexit, I'm happy to hear about it afterwards, because clearly nobody in Britain has got it at the moment. So the question I suppose for us is, how can EAP help? And that's the question. How can EAP help? What are, what's the old question? and what are the new answers. I'm not recommending this, and I don't think my maths colleagues would recommend this either. But certainly EAP can help by raising students' awareness of what critical thinking is. Getting them to think about it in more detail, not just getting them to do it. And by that I mean, well, when we get our students to do critical thinking, what are we asking them to do? What kinds of activities do we ask them to do? <laughs> Sorry? Okay, looking at identifying a fallacy in a text. Sorry? Identifying bias in a text. What other things do we ask them to do? Sorry? Okay, problem solving, thank you. Yeah, so you give them a problem, they've got a problem, solution, resolution, etc. Yeah, evaluation. So we can get them to do it. But that may mean that they're still seeing the elephant in terms of the different bits of the elephant. I can do this bit, or I do this bit. Part of the issue is, and I looked this morning through my own university's EAP materials. We have a really fantastic set of EAP materials. And they talk, they talk about critical thinking. This is for our pre-sessional English language course that is going on now. And we ask students to do things like, we teach them this to cite sources appropriately, um, in terms of the formal way of doing it, but also why it's important, why it matters. We, we talk to them about this, summarizing and synthesizing texts. If I had a pound for every time a student had asked me what to synthesize text means, I'd be a very wealthy woman. We get them to do this kind of thing, identify cause and effect, problem solution, that kind of stuff. And we get them to evaluate the solutions that they come up with. So they do these things, but the question I would put to you is, this one. <coughs> do they know why they're doing these things, other than to keep us happy? other than to pass IELTS or, or whatever it is they have to do. Do they know fundamentally why they are doing these things? And I would say that one of the ways we can get them to help, uh, sorry, we can help is by, get those voices that I shared with you earlier from my colleague, get those specialist voices into the EAP classroom, particularly, I would argue, that politician, that politics lecturer's voices, talking about the delights, uh, the morsels, the, the letting the discourse breathe, all of that stuff. Get those voices in there. So it's not just us telling them, and helping them to see the similarities across disciplines, but also where relevant, the differences within, within disciplines. The difference in maths and statistics, for example but also within, within modules on those. It's actually microeconomics and macroeconomics, that kind of stuff. Applied maths, pure maths. So we can help with that, but we can't really do it on our own. We can do it on our own, but they don't believe us. They need those disciplinary voices in there telling them. And if you can't kidnap a tame meteorologist um, you, you, to come into your class, you can go video in their office. You can ask them the question, as I did. What does critical thinking mean for you in your discipline? And just look at 30 second or one second clips, and you have a whole host of them. So they get across the message, uh, hopefully that I've got across to you, that there is similarity across all these different disciplines. And get them to tell you, okay, what is the element? What is similar? What is critical thinking across all these different disciplines? So getting students to, to, to hear those voices 
And then when they go into their departments to ask the questions, what is it? Tell me what the elephant is in uh, food and nutritional science. Tell me what the elephant is in typography. Tell me what I need to do in psychology specifically. I know what the elephant is broadly, but I need to know whether it's an Indian elephant or an African elephant, for example. And I think we can help them by giving them ways of looking at concepts. And I'm just going to share a couple of different ways with you that I think, are, well, one of them we've already had, but here's an example from geography. Uh, the references at the end, this is a, a journal on teaching geography. <coughs> And here is a suggested systematic way of fostering deeper criti critical thinking <coughs> in geography. But I offer it to you as, I like the picture, I like the icebergs, it does look a little bit like a tooth. But um, what Haig has done here is talk about different ways of looking at something in geography, such as um, climate change or population exploration or whatever, because that's covered in geography as well. Saying that actually what goes on in society is the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's in the media, what we talk about. And I think actually, given the state of knowledge and the view of experts in our societies, this is a really important heuristic for our students. I'd like to see a few more American voters working their way through this heuristic. I'd like to see some more British voters working their way through this heuristic. So there is a, the references at the end, there's an article that goes through in great detail, but talk, getting students to see that we have discourses in our society, litany if you will, that talks about um, the facts as popularly conceived. East-West tensions, for example, what it means to be a president, but what it means to be a member of a, of a European society uh, in the 21st century. That's before we go anywhere near Asia. Okay, so thinking about what, what's going on, what's the media telling us? Okay, what's the popular discourse around this topic? Climate change, population, water shortage, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is. And then moving down a layer to think about what's the objective reality that if you actually look at what's going on that we can find out about. And then moving down to the world view so that we dig even deeper. What's, what, what, are it, what, are the, what are the discourses, the narratives around it? And finally, at the very bottom, myth and metaphor. What's the myth and metaphor that's influencing the way we think about these things? Climate change, what's the myth and metaphor around climate change? Okay. Um, what, so that's sort of working from the subconscious subjective level, that's quite the way out. Read the article. I haven't done a very good job of explaining it there. There isn't much time. I'm waiting for Janice to hold me up a piece of paper. But I would, I would suggest you have a look at it because I think this is actually quite a nice way of trying to unpick a topic. And getting students, they struggle with it. If you read the article, he's very honest about how difficult his students found this to do. But take a topic and try and break it down. Get the students to tell you what the litany is around it, the systematic causes that they can identify, what the worldview is, what does Fox News say about this, for example, and then the myth and metaphor informing underneath. And then back to Mark Mason's uh, integrated critical thinking from the beginning. All of these components need to be in there. So talking to our students about critical reasoning, what it is, what a challenge it is, and how they need to do it, that, they, that you have to have a critical attitude. You can't be a critical thinker without having that attitude and that desire to be critical and identifying it when you've got it and identifying it in other people. This issue around moral orientation, what it means to be critical, and how important that is or not. Knowing what the concepts are, problem, suggestion, resolution, etc., evaluation, what the concepts are, what each of those means, and also what the knowledge of a particular discipline is. So that I'm a meteorologist, I'm a psychologist, 
I'm a food and nutritional scientist, and this is what critical thinking means to me in my discipline. This is my elephant. My elephant. <coughs> Ownership of my elephant. Paul Mason. And I said we'd come back to questions. Here we are, right at the end. Peanuts is always a good way in and out of any topic. Can you all read that? And can you read it, Anthony? Is it all right? Legible? Yeah. Okay, so that. What do we do, of course? A bit like Maggie was talking yesterday about autonomy, and somebody raised the issue with me well, what happens if students choose not to be autonomous? <laughs> this is the same thing. What happens if a bit part of being critical is students choose not to, not to be critical and not to ask, ask those questions? I think they'll then struggle in their discipline when they get onto them. I'm going to stop there. Thank you for bearing with me. I'd like you to know that was 77 PowerPoint slides, <laughs> which um, in most contexts, oh, uh, in most contexts, um, I'd be shot for that. I wouldn't let my students do 77 PowerPoint, that we're now up to 77 in, in 50 minutes. Here are some websites also that you might like to look at. Colin Beard, who's a British National Teaching Fellow, has a very simple way of unpacking critical thinking around a topic, and the topic is how to get to university. Uh, so it talks about, you know, do you go by bus, do you go by tube? I mean, literally, how to get to university, not, you know, how to pass your IELTS and hand out how to get into um, Harvard or, or Oxford or whatever. Um, the causal layered analysis that I talked about earlier, there's a TED talk that you might like to look at on that. Um, Joe Lau, here in Hong Kong, has got a fantastic critical thinking web. He's a philosopher. You know, how many of you are familiar with his work? You should be. He's got some fantastic, fantastic... Would you agree with me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so look at, look at that. He's at Hong Kong U. Uh, University of Leeds, Melinda, a wonderful MOOC. Um, which started again the day before yesterday, June the 3rd. So go and look, you can still join it. MOOC's Massive Open Online course, free. Um, you can join late. But it's, it's very simple, it's only a couple of weeks um, of work, but something to get your students doing. Get them all enrolled on it would be my idea as well. They're free, as I said, and it's, it's got some really interesting... Would you agree, Melinda? Have you had a look at it? It's got some great, great stuff here on... Uh, I'm looking at it because she's... She was latterly of um, And as I said, the next iteration started on the 3rd of June. Students can still enroll. You can be a student. I did it as part of preparation for this talk. Okay, I thought, okay, let's see what, let's see what people say about this pitch at students. And I think, yeah, that's the end of me. Those are the other references, and I think we have five minutes for questions. Thank you. To, you know, there's no point saying we're building up a really magical animal 
and I'd like you to feel the legs, and I'd like you to feel the feel the, the, this long bit of front, and then we'll draw a picture. So I, I'm not. I think you should do that, but not exclusively. And whether you want to start off by presenting it. We talked about this yesterday in the workshop, whether you're going to start off with acquisition or whether you're going to start off with practice and discussion, thinking about Diana Morillard's activity types that those who were in the workshop yesterday were, were, were grappling with. Um, so I, I think that's one tool in our armory, examples. But I wouldn't, it takes all the fun out of learning, doesn't it, if everybody sort of says, here it is, this is what it is, do this. <laughs> that's actually saying, I don't trust you to work this out for yourself. And it takes the joy, if you think of my wonderful politics colleague, it takes the joy out of it. It doesn't give them anything to chew and spit out. So give them something to chew and think about. And occasionally give them things that are bad exemplars and get them to tell you why they're bad. So it's not an elephant, it's a pussycat. And, and we're not dealing with pussycats today. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. There's another hand there, Ben. Uh, hi. Um, thank you for the, uh, the talk. Uh, it seems that, you know, uh, critical thinking requires quite a bit of experience, right? Um, so I was wondering if we could actually get students to talk about the ideas with each other. Unfortunately, yes, they do, but you don't actually take it into assessment because it's difficult you know, to assess that part of, you know, kind of work. So how do you see this? as a dilemma or do you think we can solve this issue? Because, you know, critical thinking does not rely on just one form's experience no. or... Uh, so the question is, is it fair to assess critical thinking? Is that, is that your question then? Uh, yeah, you could say that because, you know, we have our own thinking, the students have their own thinking, we have a gap between... You know, but that, that's exactly what critical thinking is about. Yeah. And if students, we're back to what is the content in which they are doing the critical thinking. And if the critical thinking is in my discipline and you're not in my discipline, then my critical thinking is going to trump yours. Sorry to use the word trump. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I think it's really important that we make it very clear to students what it is we're asking them to be critical about. Like me with typography. I wasn't a typographer, so I really struggled with being critical in typography. I spent the whole of the course just trying to work out what it was. It wasn't even a matter of what's the elephant. It was, you know, how do I, how do we get to the point where there's an elephant at all? So I think, I think we have to acknowledge that at certain stages in their career, academic career, students will have less that they can be critical about. Um, but I don't think we can't, we shouldn't, oh, sorry, I think we have to assess it. Partly because of the backwash effect of assessment. If you don't assess it, students don't take it seriously. But it's because they are assessed. When I'm marking my student's BA dissertation, she got a 2-1 because she was critical in her thinking about what she had done. Without that, as far as I'm concerned, it's sort of 2-2 two, two level. Sorry, Ben, go Obviously, I'm not your question. I think, you know, yeah, I see that they can benefit from the critical thinking of interacting with each other as peers. But it seems that it's difficult for us and we don't actually value it as much in terms of group work because okay. we, we stress individuality. Yeah. Like, you know, everyone has a number. Yes. Right? So some people would say, well, that's, I get a poor grade because that person, why should I be able to do that? So I think there is a problem here. Do you think? I'm trying, to think, I'm trying to think critically about what you're, you're saying there. I'm struggling. Um, yes, I, I think that's true. I, I think, but I, I sort of feel we've got to work with students on this. We have to. The problem is the first years, because they're novices in their disciplines. What are you going to talk? What are you going to get them to talk about? And that's why, if you look at Colin Beard's web thing, he's talking about getting to university. Some people here this morning have that struggle. Um, I've struggled. Getting, getting to ASB uh, across Hong Kong because I don't know the system yet, the transport system. So just, you know, you, you, you pick these topics out of thin air, um, but then it's how you work with them, with those novice students, novice within their discipline and novice at university level and novice within the area of critical thinking. But then I think having chosen those topics, ideally with the students, having shown them ways of doing it, and do look at Colin Beard's way of doing that. It's very simple. It's got four zones 
of sort of, of criticality, of sort of breaking down the topic. Um, and he talks about that extra leap into the first class work, where you move on from talking about getting to university, who is looking uncomfortable, or you move on to getting to, uh, get to university in terms of you go by bike, you go by foot, you go by elephant, um, into you know, what is it about students, because it was about students getting to university and their priorities in terms of, of getting to university, and what does that tell us about society and, and how we choose to use our resources in terms of transport. So that's even on a topic like that. So, there's one colleague in the back who had a question, just yeah, quite it, quickly, if I may. Yeah. It is a quick question. Um, you had lots of valuable input and questions and quotes from colleagues from different disciplines. I'm just wondering, from like a practical perspective, was that challenging to have them invested in this topic? One of the things that we find as language teachers is that discipline teachers often say, that's your job, you figure that out. Yeah. Isn't that your responsibility to teach that? And they don't want to give us that input or input. Yeah. I, I, that's a really good question. The question was, how do we get the discipline colleagues to engage with us yeah. so that we can do this? I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So you get one or two tame ones to come in and talk about the elephant in their discipline. You, you, you get the students to perform and to produce and hopefully to be more critical students. And then you get those colleagues who then receive those students into their classes to tell others about the, the efficacy of it. Yes, I'm a teaching and learning dean. So I emailed <laughs> all my chums. They're all my chums. Every single one of those I know well. And, and you know, I did it on a Saturday afternoon and by Sunday afternoon, you know, you all were 24 7, most of them would reply. So it is a matter of contact and relationships. That's really important. But and I know for EAP teachers that's a challenge for us because a lot of um, academic staff see us as other, a little bit inferior sometimes. <laughs> Um, and, but also, it's your job, you do it. And I think that the problem is they are, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, they are getting the students coming on to them, and then they turn around to you, don't they? They say, oh, they're not critical. What are you doing? And I think at that point, you say, well, I need your help in persuading, talking about what criticality means. I think all disciplines should be having sessions on what it means to be critical in my discipline at regular points in time. So I'm, I'm, you can use my name. <laughs> but it is a matter of, of having relationships and sharing that knowledge. And I would suggest that, for example, as part of your conference next year or a part of future symposiums, you get academic colleagues to come along and to talk. And you get students to come along. Get, also get final year students to talk to first year students. Get postgraduate students to talk to undergraduate students. So that the, the elephant is being explained and defined uh, and outlined by the people who are doing it, because that has validity for the students. Thank you very much indeed.